Hey everybody, what's going on? What's hot? What's hip? What's happening? What's shaking on your hump day? Hope you're having a good one. Welcome to our bonus content exclusive YouTube pre-show. The big extravaganza begins in about an hour and ten minutes. And the wind here off the charts right now, I am telling you, you'll hear it during the show. This is one of those days where you probably will get to hear some wind. It's insane right now. It's insane. Anyway, I got a couple more things to do on my tweet here. Actually, just one. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to point out for everyone listening that, uh, you know, I've been around and I think I know what's what. And uh, I wouldn't be here. You know, because this isn't my first rodeo. Uh, I wouldn't be here if I thought a reverse mortgage was a way to trick you out of your home. You know what I mean? It, it, it's, it's a reverse mortgage is a loan like any other. The only difference is how you pay it back. And for those of you who have a structured settlement or annuity, uh, all I have to say to you is <laughs> it's your money. Anyway, I think a lot of people in the uh, international sports community are, well, they're really pointing to my condemnation of the Super League is what finally brought it to its knees. Serious. Uh, I think that's the straw that broke the camel's back. Dolores Colbert, international woman of mystery, is here. She says, hello, Tom. Hello, Dolores. How are you? <laughs> Stories today. Yeah, we got them. We're going to tell you about a woman who apparently scammed $100,000 out of people on what what she called witchcraft services. 100 grand witchcraft services. Then we're going to tell you that uh, on the heels of 420, Ellen DeGeneres apparently uh, drank a bunch of weed drinks. I guess they have weed drinks. I don't know. It seems to me like they can put marijuana into just about anything these days. Cornflakes, cookies, brownies, gummies, lollipops, and apparently drinks as well. So we're going to tell you about that. And then we're also going to tell you about um, former celebrities that were, you know, they were celebrities. That's pretty much what makes them a former celebrity. And then they took new jobs. They did new jobs. They said, you know what? I'm tired of being a celebrity. I'd like a new job. And we're going to tell you about that. And I have some backup stuff here as well. So that's what's going on today. I got... Hold on. Let's just... All right. That's better. I like that better. All right. So that's what's going on today. Here on the extravaganza. For your hump day... As usual, we here at the Tom Gully Show hope that you are receiving the full, total, and complete allotment, portion, if you will, of hump that you feel you have coming your way. Hope you're getting all that. Whatever that means, I don't even know. I don't even know. So... That's what are my backup stories here today. Hold on a second. I'll, I'll get hip to the rhythm on that for you real fast. Ah, a shark attacked a woman swimming with a tourist group in Hawaii. And if we have time, just for Randy Ramos, who is a dedicated viewer of Jeopardy. Is it even called Jeopardy anymore? Isn't it like Jeopardy Plus or something? I don't even know what it is. We'll go over the best and worst Jeopardy guest hosts from Anderson Cooper to Ken Jennings. That's what's on the docket today. Yeah, we like to call it a docket. Dolores says, fabulous, Tom. Fabulous. Not a problem. I've been watching West Wing every spare waking moment that I have. Seriously. And I have to tell you, I'm, 
I got like three whole seasons left. And I enjoy watching it, but I'm like, man, if, if there was a way to speed this up, technically I have a, a season minus two, two seasons minus, no, wait, one. I got about two seasons left minus two episodes. That's still 48 hours of solid, well, not for the, uh, let's see, 36 hours. Or so. I'd have to do the math. And I really don't want to do the math. I, I don't want to do the math. So anyway, that's what we've got coming up on the show today. And we hope you'll be very, very, very excited by it. It promises to be a fine show. Day after 420. 421. Also known as Surprise Drug Test Day at a lot of workplaces. Surprise! Uh, Dolores Colbert is asking me if I've ever heard of Curtis Steiger. I don't believe I have. Curtis Steiger's and the Forest Rangers? Curtis Steiger's not Steiger, Steiger's, is an American jazz singer. He achieved a number of hits in the early 1990s, most notably the international hit I Wonder Why, which reached number five in the UK and number nine in the United States. Steiger's was born in Boise, Idaho. He started his music career as a teenager playing in rock and roll blues bands as well as receiving an education in clarinet and saxophone in high school in Boise. He acquired much of his motivation for pursuing jazz from jam sessions led by Gene Harris at the Idenha Hotel. His song, Swinging Down at 10th and Main, is a tribute to those times with Harris. After receiving his diploma, he moved to New York City, intending to become a rock musician, but he spent more time in jazz clubs singing and playing the saxophone. Arista released his debut album, which achieved multi-platinum sales. His combination of rock and soul was also popular on the soundtrack to the movie The Bodyguard, which contained his version of What's So Funny About Peace, Love, and Understanding by Nick Lowe, song written by Nick Lowe. But we all know the guy that made that song famous was Elvis Costello. That's a big Elvis Costello song. As I walk through this wicked world, searching for light in the darkness of insanity, I ask myself, is all hope lost? Is there only pain and hatred and misery? And each time I feel like losing sight, there's one thing I want to know. What's so funny about peace, love, and understanding? Uh. Anyway. I already am not, uh, I don't know how I feel about Curtis Steiger's glomming on to one of my mans. Anyway, Concord Jazz released Baby Plays Around, an album that included Chris Mindoki and Randy Brecker. He recorded several more jazzy albums for Concord before turning to the country flavor of Let's Go Out Tonight and cover versions of songs by Steve Earle, Richard Thompson, and Hayes Carl. Hayes Carl, I know Hayes Carl. If, if I was going to get dinged by YouTube... Man, YouTube is really good at, at detecting stuff because I recorded when Hayes Carl was only just starting to become famous. He did a concert in the backyard, this giant backyard, uh, the Creekside Music Series uh, in the backyard of a good friend of mine. And I brought all my recording gear and recorded it. Well, one time here on YouTube, I played one of the songs, and they even said, this song has the same melody. Uh, so they got yeah, good algorithms on YouTube. He's worked with Elton John, Eric Clapton, Prince, Bonnie Raitt, Rod Stewart, the Allman Brothers, and Joe Cocker. His song, I Wonder Why, reached number five, number nine, yeah. While You're All That Matters to Me reached number six as a follow-up single in the UK. 
He participated in the BBC television show Just the Two of Us, where he sang with journalist Penny Smith. His song This Life was for the American television show Sons of Anarchy. He also sang John the Revelator for uh, the last episode of season one for that whole thing. Baby plays around. I wonder. I wonder if that's because uh, "Baby Plays Around" is another. That's an actual Elvis Costello song. Although I don't know if that's the thing. Anyway, Agonist Revival is here, and he says, "Stone Green Host Certified." I am Stone Green. Certified by the NEAS Institute. <laughs> yeah. I'm certified. I'm soidified. Oh, I, let me view that. Aww. Isn't that charming? It's hidden. Do those guys really think that that's something that bugs me? <laughs> it just it's sad it makes them look like idiots I'm known for being extremely physical fit physically fit I should say there's people in our chat room that have seen me in real life that know this to be true so it's just like na 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 Anyway, Curtis Steigers, I'll look him up, uh, listen to some of that after the show today, Dolores. He covered, uh, it's not really an Elvis Costello song, but it kind of is. Niccolo wrote it, I think. The, Niccolo and Elvis Costello are very, very good friends. I like his You've Got the Fever. Well, let me just see here. I, I don't know how I could check this out. Uh... around Curtis well, let me see here I suppose I it would tell on the wiki if he recorded that I don't see it on the wiki though oh here it tells tells who's uh, covered it who has well why didn't it tell me who's covered it First release, highlights, versions, 14 versions. I bet you he, he gl yes, that Baby Plays Around, that is an Elvis Costello song. So he seems to like to glom on to a lot of Elvis Costello, and I don't know how I feel about that. I'd have to hear the versions. If they're good versions, I'm all in favor of it. The, Ruben Blades did a version of an Elvis Costello song. I can hardly tell the difference. It's like he's it's almost identical. What it is? What's it called? Painted from memory or something? There's uh, there's, there's an actual album that is a collection of Elvis Costello covers. Um, let's see. <sighs> oh no! It's called uh, here. I'll just. I got. I guess I got to click on this and go to Amazon real quick. I already have the album. I can see the cover of it. I just songs of Elvis Costello, bespoke songs, locked, lost dogs, detours, and rendezvous. Rendezvous. Why doesn't it have a track listing on here? Why? Why? Why would you have that and not a uh, unknown person? Don't, we don't take unknown person calls, sorry. Every time I do, I regret it. So I got to get a, tra a track listing on that. Yeah, I can't. I got to get a track listing on that. Let me see here if I can find a track listing. Amazon of some oh the cover list. Alright, let me see if it's there. 
I don't want to go digging. Th oh, no, 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 no. This is done by my... By album. Okay, let's see here. Painted from memory. No, it's a, it doesn't have the... Ah, poop. It doesn't have the one. It doesn't... Uh, B-movie. Man, oh, man. Baby Plays Around has actually been covered by way more than 14 people. Uh, let's see here if I can find it. I'm going to find this. Nope, unknown person, we can't take your call. I'm sorry. You're unknown. If you don't know who you are, then we can't really talk to you. I know you desperately want to don't you desperately want to talk to us, but we we just don't we won't be doing that. We just you're going to have to go to the trouble of coming up with one of the fake numbers that that people do. Uh, let's see here. Man, I just uh, let's see here. So, let's see songs of Elvis Costello, bespoke songs. Let's see if I get more of a. And then I want to see track listing. Oh, here we go. There we go. Maybe this will do it. Perhaps this will do it. Ah, here we go. Girls Talk by Dave Edmonds, Unwanted Number by For Real, My Brave Face by Paul McCartney, Hidden Shame by Johnny Cash, All Grown Up by Tasman Archer, Miss Mary by Zucchero, Shadow and Jimmy by Was Not Was, Upon a Veil vale of Midnight Blue by Mary Coughlin, uh, the Comedians, Roy Orbison did that one. The Deportees Club, Christy Moore covered it. Punishing Kiss, Ann Ross did it. Shamed into Love, Ruben Blades. That's the one I'm talking about. Shatterproof, Billy Bremner from The Jam covered it. Dirty Rotten Shame, Ronnie Drew. Shipbuilding, Robert Wyatt. The Birds Will Be Singing, Norma Watterson. I Want to Vanish, June Tabor. The Other End of the Telescope, Till Tuesday. Amy Mann, Until Tuesday, covered that, and it's incredible. Indoor Fireworks, kind of a, kind of a switch there because his buddy Nip, Nick Lowe is covering one of his songs. And then Almost Blue, Almost Doing Things We Used to Do, uh, Chet Baker does that it's instrumental i believe but i do have that particular cd oh yeah don't kid yourself uh let's see what we got here i like his you've got the fever james stone says i love elvis costello dolores says then you are welcome here james yes anybody who likes elvis costello yeah you're fine unless you're one of those people and then it doesn't matter you don't get extra points for liking incredible music if you're a, you know. Yes. But Curtis Steigers appears to uh, traipse around the Elvis Costello quite a bit. Let's see if he's covered of any other stuff of uh, Mr. Declan McManus. The Elvis Costello wiki. There's a wiki here. How can I do this by person? Does this do it by song? Cheaper words. Yeah, it does it by song. I want to do it by the artist. I want to do it by artist, man. I want to do it by the artist. Let's see. How can I do this? See, by collegiate performances of info needed all covers no known covers no it does it by album how on earth am i going to go through all of these and and figure that out how am i going to do that? let's see here baby plays around and so then they go they don't really do it i guess they do it by last name let's see is it going to keep me in the wiki Maybe there's spike covers, baby plays around. Well, anyway. Any stinking way. 
James Stone says, I have a lot of uh, his records on vinyl. Some original prints, too. I, I, I've got all my original. Not only do I have my original Elvis Costello vinyl. James may remember when they used to print. You know, they, you'd get the record. The record would come in plastic wrap be shrink-wrapped, and then there'd be stickers on the outside, contains hit or whatever, and uh, I think my copy of Get Happy said 20 hits, 20 on it. Uh, I still have all those stickers. I cut them out of the shrink-wrap and kept those, too. And I have all the original dust covers with the liner note, uh, everything, until I, until I just quit buying vinyl which was probably somewhere around, it was after Punch the Clock. Man, I think it's after Goodbye Cruel World. See, now I'm going to have to pinpoint. Yep, the shrink wrap and the stickers on the sleeves bugs me to know. And oh, I still have the stickers from the thing. I, I, I lost the shrink wrap, but... Uh, Elvis Costello Discog. It's got like 30 albums or something. <laughs> Let's just see here. Let's go to the studio albums. Okay, King of America, Blood and Chocolate. I know I had Blood and Chocolate on album. Spike. Spike was the first one that I did not buy vinyl for. Yeah, in 1989. Mighty Like a Rose. Yeah. yeah, that would be the first one would be Spike. So I have Blood and Chocolate, King of America, Goodbye Cruel World, Punk the Clock, Imperial Bedroom, Almost Blue, Trust, Get Happy, Arms Forces, and of course, This Year's Model, and My Aim is True. So I've got several that are there on vinyl. I, I don't think I've ever purchased... A cassette because I would eat when, when I had the cassettes I did have cassettes with Elvis Costello music on them uh, but I had a real good stereo system and I either would record them off the album onto a cassette or off the C uh, D on the cassette James Stone says I have an original print of Spike Spike that is a good album You nobody in this town. You know. Oh, I type too fast sometimes. Yeah. I think that's on sp uh, Spike. Nobody in this crowd, nobody till everybody in this town knows your poison, got your number, knows it must be avoided. You're nobody till everybody in this town thinks you're a bastard. It's the kind of story of my life. Anyway. Any old way. Curtis Steigers apparently has done a couple of Elvis Costello related songs. Dolores, and for that reason, I will be listening to them. You know, Agonist, Agonist Revival has been back to the condo for refreshments. And he's seen me in real life. And I was, at that time, I was a, 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 an Adonis. <laughs> I may not be that good a shape anymore, but not far. Not far. Pretty darn close. Here, as soon as it gets warm, I'll be right back to that. As always. I wonder what the weather is in Dallas right now. By now in Dallas, I'd have been really into my workout regimen. What? It's only 62. Friday, 77. Saturday, 77. Sunday, 84, 85, 85. And then back down to 77. It bounces up and down a little bit in April. 
Anyway. So, yes, Dolores. I'll check out Curtis Steigers. He's from Idaho. How can you not check him out? He's from Idaho. I'll have to investigate that a little bit later. I'll have to do some investigation. We don't take the unknown person calls. You got you got to go to the trouble of getting one of your fake temporary VoIP. If you can't do that, then I know you're not going to be smart enough to be on the show. Not that that means you're smart, but just trying to weed out that lower echelon as best we can. Dolores Colbert says, we had a cold front come through with record-setting lows. I don't even know what we've got today. The wind is so, you know, you can drop 20 off the degrees. Because on Saturday and Sunday, we've got wind as well. That's just great. That's really great. Nobody needs that. Who wants that? Nobody wants that. Nobody needs that nonsense. So it is hump day. And I don't know. I've still yet to find out. Let me see if I can find out what that means real quick here. Uh, let's see. Hump day origin. Hump day origin. Hump day is an idiom that means Wednesday, a day of the week. The term hump day first appeared in the 1960s in North America, most probably in business offices. Hump day is based on the idea that the work week is a mountain one must climb. Well, I don't know as I dif disagree with that, but it is the only day with a a true nickname, although... I am thinking of validating Taco Tuesday. We're getting close to having Taco Tuesday be a, an official nickname. You know. Agonist Revival says, I will confirm it here and now. Tom Gully is very tall, and I did not see a gut. Well, then. <laughs> yeah, there we are. There it is. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. There it is. Met Agonist Revival on one of the very worst <laughs> dating experiences. And uh, almost got botulism eating food at the club that <laughs> he was playing at or working at, one of the two. Dolores said, snowed close to me yesterday, one to two inches. Melted an hour later, but it really came down hard. Yeah, we got all that snow. It's gone now. There, there wasn't any when I got up this morning. I got some new neighbors that have a dog. And a couple times the dog is came and barked at me like it's going to do something. And I'm like, bring it on. Bring it on. And I think the neighbors were smart enough to understand, okay, this guy doesn't play around. He doesn't indulge our pet. But the worst thing about it, is that instead of taking their dog for a walk somewhere and instead of picking up the dog the the front of of the area where I live in is just a minefield it's like yeah thanks that the 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 people that come by and cut the grass are going to love that they're going to love that I mean a lot, like every square foot. Every square foot. No, no. You you have a pet, so we should all suffer. Thanks. Thanks for that. Anyway. Oh boy. What a day. What a day. Fabulous hump day. And uh, 
been listening to a lot of Billy Joel lately. Like I've gone through every album one at a time. I I didn't listen to him in a long time. A lot of good stuff. I don't care what people say. Billy Joel is pretty incredible. Pretty darn incredible. Have you guys seen the video of uh, Billy Joel? He's at like um, Vanderbilt. And uh, he's giving a talk in an auditorium there. And he's standing next to the piano. I assume that he played uh, some songs and stuff for him. So they're passing the microphone around. You know how they do in, in those uh, auditorium talks. And Billy Joel's standing up. He's not sitting down or anything. They passed the mic to this kid and said, uh, I've been really privileged to play with a lot of talented musicians. And he mentions the name of somebody that I understand Billy Joel had also played with extensively. I've been able to play with Kenny, somebody other, Freddie, somebody other. And um, my favorite song of yours is New York State of Mind. And I was wondering if I could play it for you. Everybody in the crowd goes, woo. And then he, and then he corrects himself. He goes, I, was, I mean, I was wondering if I could accompany you. And Billy Joel just goes, okay. And the kid gets up there. And uh, Billy Joel gets him to the sheet music, I guess. And uh, the kid destroys and Billy Joel sings the song, and the, this kid, he's doing the solos and, and showing off of them, doing stuff. And uh, at the end of the thing, Billy Joel goes over, shakes his hand, and goes, what's your name? <laughs> the kid tells him his name. And, hey, his name's Michael so-and-so. Remember that. Kid's got chops. <laughs> and then he goes, and, then he goes, and that's how you get a, song, a job as a saxophone player in New York. <laughs> Uh, Billy Joel puts on a superb, superb concert, says Dolores Colbert. Let me see if I can find that clip for you real quick. And I'll, uh, I'll put it in the room. Billy Joel Vanderbilt student. Now, there you go. There you go. Do, 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 do. Let's get the one with the, with the bajillion views on it. Huh. <sighs> Well, this one's on Billy Joel's Vivo. I guess since I've been a Billy Joel fan forever, I should go ahead and and drive traffic to Billy Joel's website, I guess. I suppose I should do that. Let's skip the ads, please. Of course, they'll never let me play this because it's, it's, this is back in 2013, but it's, I think it still I think it still stands up today. I really do. Copy. Whoops, Daisy. Copy. Come on, copy for me. Copy. There we go. There we are. I'll share it to the room here real quick. Jeffy Times says, Ask and you shall receive. I guess so. I guess so. But isn't it great that kid, you know, had the confidence and and it's gotten millions and millions of hits, of course. And uh, there's the there's the link inside the room there. You can watch it after the show, <laughs> or now I don't care. It's kind of cool because he asks him and everybody's kind of waiting and he pauses and then he just goes, okay. <laughs> oh man. Oh, man. And by the way, New York State of Mind. Oh, pff, what a great song. What a great song. I've been listening to the song Vienna. That's, that's oof, can't get it out of my head. You know, singing in the shower and all that stuff. 
but uh, so there you go if you get a chance it's there in the room I guess I could pin it can I do that I don't, I don't really there you go pin it I'm pinning it I don't know what that does frankly <laughs> I don't watch the show myself um, but uh, yeah Vanderbilt Oh, there it is up at the top. Well, what do you know? It was pinned by me. I guess I have that authority. I've got that skill. I my my first Billy Joel albums. Uh, I think the first three, if not four, were all on eight track. <laughs> I might have had a couple Costello ones on eight track, one or two. But um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure my first state, my, my my I know the stranger and Fifty Second Street and Glass Houses. I had all three of those on uh, on eight track. I think I later went back and got them on. I might have gotten them on uh, vinyl. But probably just waited, and, and I know I've got them all on CD now. So there you go. My sisters, my sisters are big Billy Joel fans as well. One of my sisters I turned on to the Clash. I think another one the Who, because they were big into the Beatles. Oh, just beat you to death with the Beatles just uh, I mean I kind of like the Beatles but I just I've heard them too much I've been I'm beetled out Paul McCartney and wings I like but anyway Curtis Steigers next up on my list of people to listen to Curtis Staggers is the man's name. Apparently. Dolores says, I love 52nd Street and the Stranger albums. Yes. Very, very good. There's actually some YouTube videos where one at a time, and he only spends two or three minutes per album, but they're individual YouTube postings where he talks about every one of his albums and says, okay, here's what I was trying to do on this one, or here's, you know. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. I wonder how many, man, there, when you think about it, because his first two or three albums were, you know, they made one hit or one thing that got FM airplay but the stranger came out uh and just destroyed i mean it it had so many hits on it uh let me see here first album was cold spring harbor which was recorded at the wrong speed or mastered at the wrong speed piano man obviously that was a single off of that album that got a lot of fm airplay Kind of like Captain Jack, Street Life Serenade, uh, and then Turnstiles. So he had four albums. One of them had The Entertainer on it, too, which was a minor hit. But then The Stranger, 52nd Street, Glass Houses, Nylon Curtain, An Innocent Man. Let's just go to his singles. Let's go to his singles, shall we? And I'll just go through the U.S. Piano Man was a number 25 hit. Uh, the Entertainer was number 34 in the United States. Just the Way You Are hit number three. Moving Out was 17. Only the Good Die Young, 24. She's Always a Woman, 17. And those were all off The Stranger. Uh, then My Life off of uh, 52nd Street, number three. Big Shot, 14. Honesty, 24. Uh... Then Glass Houses, number seven, you may be right. Number one, it's still rock and roll to me. Number 19, don't ask me why. 
Uh, Songs in the Attic had Say Goodbye to Hollywood, number 17, and She's Got Away, number 23. The Nylon Curtain had uh, Pressure, number 20. Allentown, number 17. Good Night Saigon, number 56. Man. But An Innocent Man had Tell Her About It, number 1. Uptown Girl, number 3. An Innocent Man, number 10. The Longest Time, 14. And Leave a Tender Moment Alone, uh, number 27. And Keeping the Faith, number 18. The Bridge, oh man, Until the Night is so good. The Bridge had Modern Woman, number 10, A Matter of Trust, number 10. This is the Time, number 18. Number, uh, But it was uh, Baby Grand with Ray Charles was number three on the AC chart. Uh, I'm going by the billboard, just general. But if you go through the adult contemporary, I'll do that in a second here. Um, let's see here. We didn't start the fire from Stormfront number one. I go to extremes number six. River of Dreams number three. But if you go to the AC chart, Piano Man was number four. Just the way you are was number one. She's always a num a woman number two. My life number two. Honesty number nine. Don't ask me why number one. She's Got Away, number four. Tell Her About It, number one. Uptown Girl, number two. Uh, An Innocent Man, number one. Um, where is that? An Innocent Man, number one. The Longest Time, number one. Keeping the Faith, number three. You're Only Human, number two. Uh, this is the Time, number one. Baby Grand, number three. We Didn't Start the Fire, number five. I Go to Extremes, number four. And so it goes, number five. River of Dreams, number one. Uh, so does well on the adult contemporary. Uh, let's see what the albums did here. Compilation. We don't want the compilation. <laughs> Cold Spring Harbor, number 158. Piano Man, number 27. Street Life Serenade, number one, number 35. Turnstile, number 122. Um, then we get to The Stranger, number 2. 52nd Street, number 1. Glass Houses, number 1. Nylon Curtain, number 7. Innocent Man, number 4. Uh, the Bridge, number seven. Stormfront, number one. River of Dreams, number one. I'll tell you what. That man has sold a record or two. James Stone says, my, my friend Eric has a Led Zeppelin test press. Doris Colbert says, did he do Mr. Bojangles as well? No. I don't think. Billy Joel did Mr. Bojangles. He just did Mr. Piano, just did Piano Man. Mr. Bojangles written, Dolores, by Jerry Jeff Walker. Just writing that song, Mr. Bojangles, Jerry Jeff could have lived as a very rich man the rest of his life. Uh, Dolores says, until the night. Great changes. It does have great changes in it. That's a that's a, I'm gonna have Billy Joel songs coursing through my head the rest of the But yeah, man. He was on fire. And I didn't even go through the videos because he had a lot of highly rate uh, ranked videos as well. But uh yeah. On fire. He was on fire. Of course he did those tours with Elton John. Was it called Piano Men or something? My sisters went and saw that. Mm. James Stone says, I love Jerry Jeff Walker, but I'm more of a Ray Wiley Hubbard guy. Well, it's interesting, those Texas musicians. And, and Jerry Jeff Walker, that's not his real name. He was born in New York. Uh, New York City under a different name but those guys like trade their most famous songs amongst each other those singer songs now let's face it Jerry Jeff Walker and the Viva Terlingua album probably started the whole Cosmic Cowboy thing right but Jerry Jeff Walker was born Ronald Clyde Crosby 
in Oneonta, New York. You know, the last Gonzo band. But Jerry Jeff's number one hit, uh, that well, the, the song that perhaps he's best known for, because he's got some other ones like Sangreal Wine and The Man in the Big Hat, but the big one is probably Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother. And he didn't write that. Ray Wiley Hubbard wrote that. And then, uh, not Larry McMurtry, but James McMurtry wrote Choctaw Bingo that Ray Wiley made into it. I mean, they just, they just switch them around. If you, and another good link on YouTube is Ray Wiley Hubbard telling the story behind Up Against the Wall, Redneck Mother, with Jerry Jeff sitting right next to him on stage. Um, it's awesome. Dolores says, Frank Zappa and my Jerry Jeff together were great. Agnes Revival says, not sure if you're a King Crimson fan, but they released a live show from 1984 at the Spectrum. This was the Adrian Ballou era. Amazing. They did half the discipline record. I do like King Crimson. Got some King Crimson here. Um, but, uh, he was born in Oklahoma. His mom's name was Betty Do Thelma Liz. He's not responsible for what he's doing. I wonder if I could get away with playing that that Ray Wiley Hubbard. Ray Wiley Hubbard tells the story of Up Against the Wall. Redneck Mother. I wonder if I could get away with that. It looks like just something somebody put up. I don't think it belongs to anybody. I don't know. I can always cut it out of the show if I have to. Can I tell them a little story about it? All right, we'll just do it the way we did it. We'll do it like professional. <laughs> a long time ago, in a land far away called West Texas, in northeast New Mexico, if you was a long-haired hippie musician, cosmic cowboy type, it was dangerous. <laughs> because this was before Willie Nelson sang at the Armadillo World Headquarters here in Austin, Texas, bringing, bringing the hippies and the rednecks together, <laughs> creating the hipnecks. <laughs> I used to live in Red River, New Mexico, and during the summer up there, all these ne'er-do-well Austin musicians would come up there and hang out, and we would get together each night after our day job, and we would have these, these hootenannies. <laughs> kind of makes the skin crawl to say it now. <laughs> One night we was at this heat, Nanny, and it was my turn to go get the beer. Now you open the, now there were two bars in Red River, New Mexico. You open the door where the hoot Nanny was, and right across the street was the hardcore serious cowboy hillbilly redneck country bar. Still remembers. And you just in fact that was the name of it. And you just knew if you was a hippie cosmic cowboy, you didn't go in there. Now, way down at the other end of the town, about a mile and a half away, was the safe hippie musician bar. <laughs> but I didn't want to walk all the way down there and carry a case of beer back, because it's going to be about another six months before I got my driver's license. <laughs> back. I'm not too proud of this period of my life here, but... I said, well, how bad could it really be? So I was the first hippie cosmic cowboy type to walk into the hardcore Sears Cowboy Hillbilly Redneck Country Bar. <laughs> never forgets. It's like riding a bicycle. So I walked in there, there was about 40 of these old boys and one old woman. 
And I walked in there, and I knew I was in trouble. These were rough-looking guys. And I was there, and I had my little leather moccasins on up about here, and a tie-dye shirt and a cowboy hat with a feather in it. And I knew I was in trouble. I couldn't let them know that I was intimidated, so I walked up to the bar, and I said, Hey, Gomer, give me a case of beer. <laughs> I worked on this since for a while, Jerry. The guy looked at me and said, How'd you know my name? Should have. It should have. But anyhow, these two guys, I'd like to say a fight broke out, but I didn't really hold up my end of bargain. <laughs> these guys come over, they beat me up for about 20 minutes. <laughs> then they wander off and they start playing foosball. And, and I couldn't let them get away with it. So I raised up and I said, you guys ain't so tough. I've been beat up worse than this by bikers. <laughs> I had the shaming effect that I hoped. <laughs> they came back over. <laughs> then I went back to the hoot nanny. And I stood there at the at the door and I think I said, I, I think I got my nose broken. A guy by the name of B.W. Stevenson said, Did you get the beer? <laughs> at that hoot nanny that night was Cowboy Bob Livingston. He left the next day. So I made up this song. He said, sit down. So I made up this song. Cowboy Bob was there. He left the next day, went to Cal LA, started playing with Michael Murphy. They left there, come here, and he started playing with you. Now, the story, that song wound up. It wound up. It said, one night at the broken spoke, you broke the string. And you said, Bob, sing a song. So Bob sang the song that I made up the night I got beat up in Red River, New Mexico. <laughs> and there's the story of Up Against the Wall redneck mother and if you've never heard it i highly recommend that you hear i mean you when you live in texas you can hear that song if you just walk down the street three or four blocks within about 20 minutes it's going to be coming out of the window of a passing car uh you know and if you get a chance uh there's several ray wiley hubbard concerts uh where he's playing uh solo and uh, tells little stories behind uh, some of his songs and stuff, and I, I highly recommend that too. If you haven't experienced the greatness, uh, let me let me tell you my my Ray Wiley Hubbard story. It's on one of the podcasts. Um, I was playing with a band that uh, had made it to the Shiner Rising Star semifinals, and. Uh, in between the bands playing, I had to use the restroom. So I went in there, and I'm standing up at one of the, you know, urinals. And a uh, guy walks up right next to me. And and who is it? But it's Ray Wiley Hubbard. Because he's one of the judges. And I didn't want to say anything at the urinal. I have a very strict policy of never, ever, ever speaking to another man at the urinal. And then I, so I finished, and I was washing my hands. He came over to wash his hands, and he went, Hey, how you doing? And I said, Well, I'm doing pretty good. I get to pee next to Ray Wiley Hubbard. I'm sensing it's probably not the same sense of accomplishment for you. He got a big, big, big laugh out of that. And then I, and then I later on, I met him, met him, really met him, but... Uh, he told another person about that, and they go, you know, Ray Wiley Hubbard told me that he met you over at the place, and blah, blah. anyway, and so it's a story now. Um, Dolores says, Michael Martin Murphy, Morty Vickers says, King Missile, better than King Crimson. Oh, boy. Uh, James Stone, oh, man, the armadillo. You could get anything you wanted at the armadillo. James knows an excellent retelling of the co the cosmic cowboy way. Love Scrappy Judd too. Hey, Terry Lawler is here. I didn't see that, but Terry Lawler, the King of Ireland, happens to be with us this evening. Good to see him. Good to see him. Hey, man. Shiner Sundays at Love and War in Texas. Oh man. Oh man. Oh man. Maybe going on down to Lukenbach. 
get yourself down to Lukenbach, go down to Green Hall, and just go over there, Sons of Herman Hall, go over to there's a lot of places. Lee Harvey's, the double wide. There's a lot of places, man. There's a lot of places. A lot of good places. Sundays are great because um, most of the Texas musicians, not not all of them, but most of them, uh, are great about playing benefits for people, for, you know, people that are down in their luck or a certain charity or whatever. And so on Sunday, that's the day that's sort of set aside that uh, you can go various places and see 10 of these guys in one day. I mean, it's it's awesome. James Stone says, Waylon Jennings is my favorite of all time, man. Oh, yeah. Just a good old boy. Um, Waylon, Merle. Gotta love you some Merle. Gotta love you. Some. If we're not back in love by Monday. Oh, yeah. There's a little Tom T. Hall for you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love all that stuff. Not so, uh, not so crazy about the pop country. I do like Trace Atkins, though. Dolores Colbert says, "Sons of Herman Hall." My buddy Cornell Hurd plays there a lot. Everybody plays there. It's like a Knights of Columbus, only like nine thousand times cooler. <laughs> and then if you go down into Deep Ellum. Because uh, I was lucky, I got to play with all the, not all the, but a lot of the Texas country or Red Dirt or Americana, whatever you want to call it, uh, bands. And then I played with a lot of the blues bands. And then I also got to play with a lot of the sort of, I don't even, just sort of up, I would just call them uh, alternative bands in Deep Ellum. At the Liquid Lounge or Club Dada or Trees or Club uh, Clearview or whatever. Morty, uh, Morty Vicker says, David Allen Coe. Oh, got to love you some David Allen Coe. You don't have to call me darling, darling. Yeah, you. you that, that's uh, David Allen Coe. Or some by God Gary Stewart, or some Gary P. Nunn. Gary P. Nunn. With, uh, you ask me what I like about Texas? So, oh, yeah. Terry Lawler says he's back on nights. Oh, <coughs> man. <clears throat> back on nights. I'm just back on being glad that the Super League has collapsed. And many football pundits across the pond have pointed at my castigation of the Super League as, as the straw that broke the camel's back. They knew once they'd lost me, I guess there's only one team left that hasn't officially, I think it's Juventus maybe, Dolores says, David Allen Coe used to hang out with us at the Jubilation in Hearst. Yeah, you, you, could, you could see David Allen Coe or, or um, Billy Joe Shaver. A lot of those guys. Charlie Pride, man. You could see him. Man. There was, I forget the name. There's a big sort of a country diner. It's big. It's, it's, it's on... Uh, Oh, uh, Preston. It's it's on Preston, uh, way up north. And you can see him there. Mama's daughter's there. There's a bunch of diners in that area where you'd see Charlie Pride all the time. I mean, all the time. And you just go up, say hi to him. Yeah, he's a good guy. Dolores is making me second homesick, Tom. Hey, well, yeah, I'm getting homesick myself over that. Um... But, uh, yeah, that was the cool thing that I noticed. Because when I played the blues other places, um, I played in the house band at a 
the blues venue in Indianapolis for a long time. And then we'll go up to Chicago quite a bit. And there, there was certainly a hardcore, you know, number of people that would be at those clubs. But uh, it, it just wasn't the same as the Texas music scene. It's like the artists and the fans are almost inseparable in terms of you, they get off the stage and you don't feel like you can't approach them or that they won't sit down at your table and rap with you for an hour or whatever. And uh, the people that follow that music, once you're in with that group of people, you're in with all of them. You're in with all of them. I remember I had played uh, with, uh, and I've told this story on the show so many times I'm not going to tell it again, but I played with this one band at a place up in Plano and then went to a different show on that Saturday. Where, 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 where were we seeing? Because we weren't playing that night. The, the guys in the band asked me to come out to it. And I got there, and there was a ton of the same people. And, of course, I met a lot of other people. But it was like, you're in. You're, you're one of us now. You're, there, there was no... Uh, it's, it's a real, real tight-knit group of people. Terry Lawler says, Driving around Ireland at night isn't as appealing as it would be during the day. But, yeah, I get you with the Super League. Some of my football-loving friends here were really depressed about it. Uh, Dolores says, The Texas music scene is where it's at. It really is. It it really is. That's uh, uh, and so many incredible uh, musicians, um, and certainly those people put a high high regard on the singer songwriter. They love people that can write great songs. And uh, uh, Morty Vickers says that's pretty cool, Ms. Colbert. The Jubilation sounds like it was a really great place. Um, Dolores Colbert says Joe Ely at JJ's Blues Bar all the time and Elvis Costello as well of a lot, a lot of others well I played JJ's Blues Bar many a time many a time and to drag my rear end over to Fort Worth but uh, played there many a time as long as Hash Brown wasn't around I would just leave when he would show up. And then I started playing all these bands and he would always come up to me like he liked me and we we're buddies. And I'm like, man, nobody's done me as dirty as you have and lose the stupid name. Um, and when I would tell other musicians about my experiences with Hash Brown, they would go, oh yeah, he did the same thing to me. I'm like, dude, don't, don't show up and say it's an open blues jam when it is not open, it is not the blues, and it is not a jam. You guys are playing surfer music, for crying out loud, and anything else. You know, you're doing covers of Beach Boys songs. If you're going to play the blues, play the blues. It's like, He'd come up to me at Club Dada and, hey, man, you sound great. Hey, it's just drop it. Drop. I'm never going to like you. <laughs> These guys, I just showed up. The The first time I played with Cass Haley, somebody that that just followed him said, hey, this guy's a killer harp player. Hey, well, you should get up and play with us. Ended up playing with him for like four years. Every band every date out of town and all over the place and you gotta like beg for permission to play five minutes with hash brown yeah white guy named hash brown i forget what his real name is it's like brian something or other <sighs> if, if i if i see a bill that he's on i just i'm like i'm out Hey, you want to go to the thing? Who's playing? Well, there's so and so, so and so. Hash Brown is up. Uh, no, not going. Not going. Not going to watch him spare people to death. Terry Lawler says, I presume the blues is your first choice genre. Is it, Tom? You know, um, that's what I cut my teeth on. 
Yeah, for a long, long time. And it wasn't until I got to Texas and started playing this awesome, you know, with Jay's band, uh, this awesome blend of like country, blues, and rock put together. I mean, uh, Dolores says, have you ever saw a woman saunter up to the stage slyly while pulling her panties off and playing them? Oh, that was you, Dolores? I never saw that. Although one night up at Hanks in McKinney, another great place, I was playing, and I think I had my eyes closed while I was jamming or I was looking the other way, and Jay just elbows me a couple times and goes, and just points. And there's a dude, it was like 5'6", had to weigh 300 pounds. He's wearing cowboy boots, jeans, no shirt, and a woman's bustier. And we're, we're all just like, what? in the Sam Hill has happened there. There there was a lot of stuff that we get the, hey. Uh, mm, Hey, I better cue up my song. Better cue up my song. Get into this show here, but yeah. Oh yeah, lots of good times. Hank's in McKinney. Really great place. Good old Hank's. Let's see here. Just off I-75. Uh, Morty Vickers says, he parties. Oh, yeah, he was partying. Um, the Cowboy Club, if you keep going up north on uh, 75, up there in Van Alstine, yeah. If you're driving out of Dallas, heading north on 75, there's a place that exit 62, cross the something county line. There's a song called The Cowboy Club by Robbie White that's it's awesome. It's about the Cowboy Club. Uh, you got a pair, got to go up there to Van Alstein. <laughs> Dolores says she's late. She's got to go. Manana, Dolores, have a good show. Thank you for joining us. Have yourself a good old show, Dolores. Morty says, you mean the 75? Yep. In Dallas, yeah. No, I know what you're doing, Morty. Yeah, you take the 75. No, just 75. <laughs> I think that's LBJ freeway. They call it several different things. Uh, might as well just get that going there. Let's see here. What do they, uh, uh, let's see here. What are the names for that? Hmm. North Central Expressway. Across the Grayson County line. I think it's the the service road is called the LBJ. They call it everything, man. They call it everything. Let's see here. Trying to see what they... Yeah, it, it goes for quite a ways. Starts off in Dallas, goes all the way up to Denison. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Let's see, 52. Yep, exit 52. Cross the Grayson County line. You can go there in your pickup or in your Harley. Or in your car. Anyway. Anyway, we got about a minute and a half here. We'll get this thing going. I do have a bunch of... I have a bunch of... I recorded so much music at those places. I got got tons of it. Tons of it. Whole bunches of it. Yeah, yeah. You get, I, I'd love to be at the Cowboy Club right now. Love to 
kitchen's still open. And everything. I wonder what's going on at the Cowboy Club tonight. Maybe they got karaoke. Maybe somebody's in there playing. Maybe they got Brian Burns. Or somebody up in there. All right. I got a whole podcast about a tribute Ronnie Spears did up there before he passed away for his Aunt Susu. And there's like the most star-studded lineup of people out for that benefit. And I've interviewed all of them. So there you go. I think I have 20 seconds left here. So we got a big show planned for your hump day and uh, great things. You're just going to love it. It's going to be the most fun you've ever had without laughing. I swear to you. I swear. All right, hold on here. And uh, we'll just do a show. Tom Gully rides the waves like a social airplane. And you know that he is not winning, not until you know his name. Soon he'll be far away, and we'll have to run this race as long as we should never underestimate. Someone who knows his place Unlike Tom Gully Ooh, the social airplane That is Tom Gully Ooh, come on now, look at my gully Tom Gully Ladies and gentlemen, can I please have your attention? I've just been handed an urgent and horrifying news story. And I need all of you to stop what you're doing and listen. What is your motto here? Boys, inform on your classmates. Save your hide. Anything short of that, we're gonna burn you at the stake? Warriors, come out to play. Oh, you all talk big. But who here has the guts to stop me? Is this not why you are here? I'm gonna give you a little touch-up. Little touch-up. Just a little touch-up for you. Ladies and gentlemen, and children of all ages, prepare for entertainment. It's time for the Tom Gully Show. And now, here he is, a very special man, Tom Gully. That's right, I am Tom Gully, and I am a very special man. I'm so special, I once spent private time with Ray Wiley Hubbard. It's true. Hey, thanks for watching us today and listening to us on YouTube Live. You could have found out about it on the Tom Gully Show Facebook page or the SonicAsylumRadio.com Facebook page. Or you might just be listening to us on kctkradio.com. Nothing wrong with listening. And uh, as always on this program, you can call in at any time with any question, any topic, or any subject, including, but not limited to, the subjects of automotive, lawn and garden, home improvement, personal relationships, and of course, the ever-popular hygiene. All you got to do is call the number at the bottom of the screen. If you're watching us, 817-522-3948 and happen to be listening to us, that number once again is 817-522-3948. Stories, yeah, we got them. Uh, today we're going to tell you about a woman who's been charged for swindling people out of the total of $100,000 on what she refers to as witchcraft services. We're going to tell you about Ellen DeGeneres and weed drinks on the day after 420. And we're also going to go over celebrities who quit being a celebrity and decided to do other things than being a celebrity. And of course, what would the show be without musical fanfare? Boy, that's some top quality fanfare. Yes, siree. As always, we have the finest human beings in the history of mankind on our 
YouTube chat room, which is spilled over from our bonus content exclusive YouTube pre-show, which starts about an hour and 15 minutes before this, our network program. Those people include Morty Vicker, the Sultan of the Outdoor Grill and Master of the Banhammer. Terry Lawler, the King of Ireland, is with us. A little earlier, Dolores Colbert, international woman of mystery, was hanging about. We also have James Stone in the house and uh, Agonist Revival, who has been back to the condo for refreshments. Not many people have been back to the condo for refreshments. So we've got that. And Midnight Shepherd has just joined us. Let's see here. What do we got here? Morty Vickers says, I hear, hear there is the Lyrid Meteor Shower tonight, for those who care. I don't even know what that is. And, and strangely enough, now I do care. I do care. Terry Lawler says, Morty, we're, gonna, we're supposed to be able to see it over the Irish skies tonight. No cloud cover. Only time there's no cloud cover in this country and has to be at night. It's normally <laughs> raining. Uh, and Midnight Shepherd is espousing his affection for musical fanfare. Morty Vickers has been raining all day, but the sun just came out in the last 25 minutes or so. So for those of you who are interested, uh, I hope you get to see the meteor shower. Mm. There's hardly ever clouds here at night. And because we are out in the middle of nowhere and there's no lights from nearby cities to speak of to mess things up, you can see a million stars in the sky. I, it, it blew me away when I first moved here. I'd go out at nighttime and just look up and be, whoa, that's a lot of stars. The luck of a thousand stars. Anyway. I think Thomas Hamilton would appreciate that because I think Big Country was a, was a Scottish band. Big Country? I think they were Scottish, right? They weren't Scottish. They were Irish, and I don't think they were, though. Let's see here. Yeah, Scottish. In a big country, dreams stay with you. Like a lover's voice on a man inside. The Reverend Wild Bill is here. He, of course, is the official spiritual advisor to the Tom Gully Show. Down there in Hotlanta with his attack tarantula Morticia. And now his Emperor Scorpion Wang. Yes, Wang. I think that's the name of the scorpion. Terry Lawler says, in the middle of nowhere with internet connection, you're blessed there, Tom. I have lightning fast internet here. But there's no cable, really, to speak of. They do have phone lines, so they run the phone lines, and they upgraded them all, and they're trying to upgrade the whole county, you know. So I do have a really good internet connection here. There's other places. The place... Um, I was at like the first month or two I lived here. It has rotten internet speed. Rotten. Terrible. But this place has lightning fast most of the time. They have little glitches, but uh, most of the time it's pretty good. It's pretty darn good. So... That's what's going on. Hope, as always, here at the Tom Gully Show, that you are having a fine hump day and you are receiving the full, total, and complete portion or allotment of hump that you so desperately crave and you so richly deserve. Uh, Reverend Wild Bill is calling his Emperor Scorpion Wang the Merciless. <laughs> okay. All right, then. All righty, then. I got so much West Wing to watch after this is over. Um, let's see here. Now we got a couple minutes till we do the news. Actually, I should probably get to it because I got like seven stories here. Five stories. Some amount of stories 
beyond the three that I normally have prepped. But uh, anyway, 817-522-3948 is this the number to call. Let's get to the news. Let's just go ahead. and Why stand on ceremony? What's six minutes? Who cares? Uh, let's see here. Do I have anything appropriate for today's? Uh, maybe I'm about this one. Um, I love the smell of napalm in the morning. There we go. Let's see. I should probably get another one. Um, I don't know why, but I just like this one. I don't know why. Someday I gotta have a long talk with that boy. <laughs> I just like that one. Uh, I just like that. It makes me. It's funny. It's funny. It makes me laugh. <laughs> oh, let's see here. Let's just go ahead. I think I've got the phone lines open. Hold on. Yeah, I do. All right. All right, then. Now, yeah, here we go. I do have the phone lines open. Sometimes I don't. I don't. Let me just go ahead and get this loaded up so I don't have to do it in the middle of the... I uh, have to do it in the middle of reading the story. Come on, there we go. Police in Florida are looking for a woman accused of scamming local residents out of thousands of dollars by charging them for allegedly bogus spiritual and witchcraft services. The Naples Police Department is asking the public for help in what they've described as a fraud investigation involving a woman who charged at least 10 people a collective total of at least $100,000 for her witchcraft services. Investigators first became aware of the alleged scam around March 14th when one or more of the people reported the woman. Police said the victims reported to have been deprived of large amounts of money and the in-person scam is believed to have run from mid-January to mid-March. Victims have described the woman as being possibly Eastern European or Hispanic, roughly 5'2", tall, with medium build and blonde hair with dark roots. She speaks Spanish and has light-colored eyes, light-colored brown eyes. Police ask anyone with information to call the Naples, Florida Police Department. I used to live down there. Uh, they don't say how old she is. Oh, man, there's all these um, wanted signs that are in Spanish. Well, I might as well, just in case, just in case you've seen that chick, you know, around, you might not want to give her any money for witchcraft services. Let me see here. Um, Midnight Shepherd says, hey, like the show. Don't forget to like and share. Help spread the word of Tom. Thank you, uh, Midnight. Reverend Wild Bill says, Today, Jiminy Cricket ran into Emperor Wang today. Oh, boy. That had to be wonderful. That had to be great. <laughs> uh, Jiminy Cricket probably lost that battle. Morty Vicker says, What's the movie that John Wayne meets the boy, yeets the boy into the pond after finding out he can't swim? That would be Hondo. It's Hondo where he throws him in. Hondo. All right. Uh, okay, let me. Why do they do this read more? You know, why, why should I have to click that button? You should just load the page of the whole story. It should just be there for me. Ellen DeGeneres appeared on Jimmy Kimmel Live on 420 to reveal that consuming a marijuana drink recently complicated an emergency situation involving her wife, Portia de Rossi, the 63-year-old comedian, previously said de Rossi had to be rushed to the emergency room in March after some pain she was suffering got even worse as the night went on. Turned out that the actress needed an emergency appendectomy and is already recovering nicely. However, she explained to Kimmel that the situation was made more difficult by DeGeneres' decision to consume a hearty amount of weed beverages before the incident. DeGeneres explained that she's not normally one to consume marijuana, saying she really hates the way it feels. However, in a stroke of bad luck, she decided to give it a shot on the night DeRossi was complaining about not feeling well. 
It was roughly 7.30 p.m. when she started complaining about not feeling well. Not thinking much of it, the talk show host decided to partake in an effort to have some better sleep. So Chelsea Handler told me about these weed drinks. They're called Can. They have CBD or THC. I don't know what the good thing is, Ellen explained. I drank one and it didn't feel anything, so I drank three. And then I took two melatonin sleep pills. I'm laying in bed and I realize Porsche's not in bed. She added, she's moaning. I get out of bed and she's on the ground on all fours. And I said, you're not okay. She goes, I'm okay. I said, no, unless you're playing Twister by yourself, you're not okay. So I rushed her to the emergency room. That that prompted Kimmel to question whether or not DeGeneres drove her wife herself after admitting to being on, on marijuana. She said, I, I did. I mean, I, I it kicked in my, my adrenaline because I just had to rush her there. It's probably not safe. I shouldn't be saying any of this. Fortunately, nothing bad happened, and Nurasi got the care she needed. Ellen concluded the clip by informing the talk show host that her wife is currently doing much better. Nice to know that Ellen's, you know, she's so nice that she'll put all of our lives in jeopardy and and all that. Um uh, you know, that's nice to know. That's nice to know. Very nice to know. Morty Vicker says, hello, Midnight. How goes it, Duder? Reverend Wild Bill says, uh, never stung him, ate Jiminy alive. Oh, boy. Okay. Cameron Diaz, whom you all know from There's Something About Mary, Charlie's Angels, and Shrek retired supposedly in 2014 from Hollywood. Uh, she married Benji Madden of the band Good Charlotte. Together they have a daughter Radix and live a low profile life in Los Angeles where her current role is mom. I didn't realize she'd retired. Jean Hackman, the French Connection, Superman, Unforgiven, Hoosiers, uh, he was last seen in Mooseport. Welcome to Mooseport, 2004. Since retiring in 2004, Hackman, who turned 91 this year, has enjoyed a successful writing career. He's written two novels and co-written four more. He lives a quiet life out of the spotlight with his second wife, Betsy Arakawa. The couple has been married for three decades. I knew he was retired. Bridget Fonda. She's from Singles and Single White Female. She was last seen in Snow Queen in 2002. Following her last film, the TV movie Snow Queen, Fonda was in a car accident in 2003 that broke some vertebra. Later that year, she married composer Danny Elfman, formerly of Oingo Boingo. The couple has a son together, Oliver, and while Fonda has shied away from the Hollywood scene since... Her husband is often accompanied by Oliver when occasionally walking the red carpet. Doesn't really tell what her new career is, though. Um, Reverend Wild Bill says, Tom, if you can't tell, I'm on the iPad. I could tell. I'm doing a lot of Taiwanese translation. They have these ads in the middle of these lists. And... Uh, Everybody remember Phoebe Cates, now known as Phoebe Cates Klein, Fast Times at Ridgemont High and Gremlins. She was last seen in the anniversary party, uh, 2001. In 1989, in the midst of her acting career, Cates mellowed, mer mellowed married fe fellow actor Kevin Klein. The famous duo has two children together, and while Cates never intended to end her acting career, she just found the role of mother to be more compelling than any part that's come her way. These days, she's retired still happily married to Klein and enjoys being a mother to their brood of children. So there you are. It's, it's just career. I, mean, I know it's career. I know it's a thing. But <laughs> Danny Lloyd, the little boy from The Shining. Uh, following the success of his breakout movie, The Shining, and once he plays Danny Torrance, the son of Jack, Lloyd made one more movie that ended up being a TV movie before leaving Hollywood to live a relatively normal life. He came back for a cameo in Dr. Sleep, 
the 2019 sequel to The Shining, but remains otherwise retired from acting. He found his calling in teaching and is a biology teacher. He's married, and he has four kids, Mrs. Torrance. Mrs. Torrance. Mrs. Torrance. Peter Ostrom. Uh, Peter Ostrom. He's most famous from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Fam Factory. He played Charlie. Uh, after starring in the hit film Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory as Charlie, Ostrom decided acting wasn't for him. He turned down a three-film contract and finished school and then went to college and is now a veterinarian for a large animal farm in Glenfield, New York. He's married with two children and lives a life about as far removed from the Hollywood lights as you can get. But I bet you he still goes to those things where the celebrities sign the things. You know what I mean? You remember the movie 16 Candles? Molly Ringwald's turned 16. The, the, the hot boy with the funny, poofy hair in the front. Well, his name is Michael Scheffling, otherwise known as the teen heartthrob to anyone over 40. The 16 Candles star turned 61 this year. He retired officially from acting in 1991 and moved his family, model and actress Valerie C. Robinson and their two children, to Pennsylvania, where he opened a woodworking and furniture shop. To this day, he is married and running his shop. So there you go. Karen Parsons from The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, far removed from her on-screen personality, Hillary Banks of The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Parsons now runs a nonprofit she started called Sweet Blackberry that aims to educate about untold figures in African-American history. She's also a seasoned author with two children's fiction books under her belt. She's married and she's got two chillins. Two chillins. <laughs> Morty says, no, no injuries, injuries midnight. Sounds like a good day. It is a good day. Jeff Cohen from The Goonies. Since starring as Chunk in The Goonies and originating the fat shaming truffle shuffle, Cohen leads a relatively normal life. He attended UC Berkeley School of Law and at the age of 27 founded the entertainment law firm Cohen Gardner Law, where he still works. He also wrote a book, The Dealmaker's Ten Commandments, Ten Essential Tools for Business, Forged in the Trenches of Hollywood. And here's what Chunk looks like today. That is Chunk today. So he doesn't look like he's as chunky as Chunk. Josh Saviano of The Wonder Years. Remember what Bill says, I have a new movie prop for the room this Saturday. A life-size gremlin from the movie. Hey, now. Morty Vickers says, watch Goonies last night with the kids. It's a good movie. Uh, Josh Saviano, Saviano from The Wonder Years. Although Saviano officially retired after his six-season stint on The Wonder Years, he returned for three episodes of Law & Order Special Victims Unit, in which he played a lawyer. In the case of life-imitating art, he is a lawyer and businessman. He founded Act 3 Advisors and co-founded the Spotlight Advisory Group, where he remains today. He's married with one daughter. So there you go. Charlie Corsmo from Dick Tracy and Hook. Since walking away from Hollywood, Corsmo has had quite an academic career. He got a degree in physics from MIT, then a law degree from Yale. His resume boasts positions with the government in missile defense, position at the Environmental Protection Agency, working for the GOP in the House of Representatives, and associate at Sullivan Cromwell. Currently, he is back to academics and is a, an assistant professor at Case Western Reserve University. And there you are. Charlie Corsmo. No, no. Mike Vitar. The most famous work, The Sandlot, and a couple Mighty Ducks movies, despite his acting success in childhood. Vitar left the stage in 1997 after filming one episode of Chicago Hope in an insignificant role. Since then, his roles have been L.A. area firefighter, husband, and dad to three children, roles he seems to relish more than the spotlight. Amanda Bynes from The Amanda Bynes Show 
and She's All That, and Hairspray. The Nickelodeon child star left the limelight in 2010 after filming the comedy Easy A. In the years that followed, Bynes reportedly suffered from substance abuse and mental health issues. These days, those issues in check. She graduated recently from the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising in L.A. with the goal of starting her own online store. So there you are. There you go. Reverend Wild Bill loves the Goonies. Midnight Shepherd says he did knock his funny bone on a windowsill. It wasn't funny, though. Morty says, well, you always got no, you, you can always hurt yourself tomorrow. Don't, not, don't, don't, don't uh, be so hard on yourself. Okay. In honor of the chef, Randy Ramos, we'd like to mention we're going to rank the guest Jeopardy hosts from worst to first. Number six in dead last place, Dr. Mehmet Oz. Oh, you knew he was going to be dead last. The controversial TV doctor who has come under fire for his medical advice. Uh, it was an odd choice for hosting the show that rankled many fans, and while much of the criticism of Oz rolled in before his episodes even began airing, his appearance didn't do much to prove critics wrong. Fundamentally, Oz lacks the quick wit and timing required for this job, and his early episodes dragged. His lazy, nasally clue reading was irksome and interrupted the flow of the gameplay. He also struggled with the occasional fun facts that Jeopardy hosts to add to the clue, Stopping the momentum. Number five, Katie Couric. I would rank her higher than this. but um, Katie Couric, the former Today host and CBS Evening News anchor, made history as the first woman to host Jeopardy and did an admirable job during her two-week stint. Couric perhaps brought more of her bright, enthusiastic personality to the job than viewers were used to. Sometimes she distracted from the game or spent too much time getting chummy with the contestants. But overall, she was an admirable host. Number four, Aaron Rodgers. Aaron Rodgers. If you ever wondered what it might be like for a very chill, very friendly bro to host the game show, Green Bay Packers quarterback Aaron Rodgers is here for you. The former Super Bowl champion, and perhaps more importantly, a one-time Celebrity Jeopardy champion, Brought an extremely relaxed and genial presence to the series in his guest hosting debut, happily noting that when he had never heard of an answer, and easily cracking jokes in the middle of reading clues. Occasionally, his approach was a little too casual, and at least one football fan contestant was certainly very chummy with him. But overall, he was a soothing presence. Anderson Cooper at number three. Consummate newscaster, Cooper slid into the guest hosting gig with ease, although he had none of the early shakes of Rogers, Oz, or Jennings. Occasionally, he took a bit too long to acknowledge right or wrong answers and spent too much time apologizing to connect contestants who got it wrong. But he is certainly smooth, quick with a joke, and comfortable at the job. Cooper's innate suavity has quickly proven to be among the most important and elusive qualities of the successful guest host. If Cooper took the gig full-time, it certainly... Would not be much of a change from Alex Trebek. Number two, Ken Jennings. The greatest of all time winner and longtime champ was the first to take up the guest host mantle after Trebek's death. And he was a comforting, familiar presence who got the job done. His ability to connect with contestants was his key charm, considering he intimately knows what it's like to be in their shoes. Jennings only lacks the svelte, debonair effect that made Trebek so appealing to viewers. And he sometimes wobbled or struggled to get through an awkward situation. He was possibly the only guest host who could have immediately followed Trebek, and he deserves immense credit for keeping the show going and helping viewers mourn the late host. Number one is Mike Richards. Mike Richards. Jeopardy! executive producer Richards took a turn at the podium between Jennings and Couric and quickly won ardent supporters. And it's easy to see why, from his cool and sleek delivery of clues to his clever banter, Richards was both comforting and uncontroversial, taking his cues from Trebek's work but never directly copying him. His ease in the job was apparent and his familiarity with the clues and gameplay as producer made him familiar with the show. Although Richards has hosted game shows before, including Beauty and the Geek and Pyramid, he was unknown to many Jeopardy! viewers. 
Uh, he ended each episode with Trebek's call to be kind to one another, and he seems like a genuine candidate for the job. I don't care who they get. I mean, we are just talking about a guy that reads stuff off a teleprompter, right? Right? Oh, see, the actress that played the the baby, there were two actresses that played the baby because kids that young aren't allowed to work a full Hollywood day, so they're twins. Um, you're not thinking of Half Pint, Melissa Gilbert, are you? Um yeah, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to the fabulous program. Let me see if I can get that Little House in the Prairie answer for you here real quick. American Drama Series. Little House on the Prairie. Because there's Half Pint, and then there's, you know... Then there's uh, Carrie Ingalls, who was the baby. And that was played by Lindsay and Sidney Greenbush. So. They, uh, twins. Because you couldn't, I don't think you were allowed at the time, and probably still aren't, to... Uh, you know, <coughs> I have kids work <clears throat> that long of a day. Lindsay, Sydney, Greenbush, they kind of mashed the names together. Uh, Lindsay did most of the scenes as Carrie. They were identical twins. Twins decided to retire from acting after starring in some commercials following the series, and they uh, graduated from Santa Monica High in 1988. Sydney married a horse breeder, and uh, they are. What more do you want, really? They did. They did a lot of Little House in the Prairie. We'll put it that way. That's the baby, though. That's the baby. That's that's not, you know. No, there wasn't a baby younger than Half Pint. Wasn't there a baby younger than... Yeah, yeah, Carrie. That's her. And they wrote her out at some point. They sent her to Iowa or something. They'd get her off the show. or Just to get her off of the show. Just to get her off this stupid show. Come on. There we go. A woman in Hawaii was hospitalized Tuesday after what officials believed to be a 10-foot tiger sharp bit her while she was swimming off the coast with a tourist group. The attack happened around 8.50 a.m. near Kukiko Resort Clubhouse on Hawaiian Island when the victim, who has not been identified, was about 200 yards offshore with an ocean excursion group of 17 people, said the Hawaii Department of Navigation. Can't read today. The victim was one of two members of the swimming group, while eight others were on stand-up paddle boards and six others in canoes. Before the attack, a jet ski operator told the group that a 10-foot tiger shark was in the area. The shark approached the 57-year-old woman from behind and bit her, leaving an approximately two-inch puncture wound to her left knee. The injured woman was brought into one of the canoes and taken to shore and given first aid. She was later treated at the North Hawaii Medical Center, where she was in stable condition. Officials closed the beaches for the rest of the day. While some species of shark are known to move in shore to feed at dusk, dawn, and at night, tiger sharks are known to bite people at all times of the day. They don't care what time it is. Tiger shark, man, they just don't care. Could be any time of the day. They, they, don't, know. they don't really care. Let's see here. Oh, midnight. Midnight, midnight, midnight. It's just... just it, you know, I just occasionally... Occasionally... You don't have to shoot a three-pointer. 
Just go for a layup. You know what I mean? You don't always have to shoot from downtown. That's all I'm saying. That's really all I'm saying. So anyway, there's our stories for today. I hope you enjoyed them. Because they're over now. They're completely over now. Little House on the Prairie. That show ran for a long time. I think. Let's, uh, let me see here. I think that show was on for a long time. A lot more happened to the Ingalls Wilder family on that show than in real life. 204 episodes plus four specials. It was on for nine seasons. That's a long time. Michael Landon, Melissa Gilbert, Karen Grassle, Melissa Sue Anderson. Melissa Sue Anderson, like, played a blind girl on that show and then got really good looking as a, you know, adult. Um, she's also known for her film roles, including Vivian in Midnight Offerings, Ginny in the slasher film Happy Birthday to Me, and Alex in the ABC After School special Which Mother is Mine? She's born in Berkeley, California. And uh, she appeared in commercials for Mattel and Sears. And she was in the TV movie James at 15. Boy, oh boy. The love in James at 15 was a pretty racy show. Let me tell you. Let me tell you. Oh, brother. The real Mary Ingalls never became a teacher, nor got married. So, there you are. She was on Bewitched. She was on The Brady Bunch. She was on uh, the TV show Shaft. The Loneliest Runner. Is that the one about the kid that wet his pants? Yeah. Yeah, she was in that. Then she was on James at 15, so she did two Lance Kerwin <laughs> uh, things. She was on The Love Boat. She was on the ABC After School Special again. She was on Chips Fantasy Island. Um, Spider-Man and His Amazing Friends. Finder of Lost Loves. Murder, She Wrote. Glitter. Hotel, The Equalizer, The Return of Sam McLeod. She played McLeod's daughter. Burke's Law. She uh, last appeared uh, on TV uh, in a voice role in 2007. Uh, in the movies, she was in The Con Is On. She was in the Veronica Mars movie. Uh... Oh, wow. She was in Dead Men Don't Die. Far North, The Suicide Club, Chattanooga Choo Choo. Happy birthday to me. What's she doing now? Not much, apparently. I bet you she'll sign your autograph for $10 or whatever. Now, well, 25 bucks. You know. Probably 25 bucks. Maybe more. I don't know. I don't even know if she does that. Uh, let's see here. Uh, well, I am the king of the bad puns, says uh, Midnight. No, no, Emperor of the Universe. Uh, and he's proud of it. Uh, Terry Lawler says, Melissa wasn't someone you... <laughs> kick out of bed for even cracking, cr crack crackers. What does that even mean? Y'all end up with some weird stuff, <laughs> says Morty. I don't know what it means. I have no idea what it means. None whatsoever. But yeah, Little House on the Break, 204 episodes. That's a lot of episodes. Nine seasons. Michael Landon like wrote and directed a ton of them. A ton of them. 
directed a ton of them. Lance at 15. Let me tell you, that was a controversial show at in 1977 or 70, whatever it was. Mm. Let me see if I can find out about that. I don't know if many of you remember that. James at 15, excuse me, starring Lance Kerwin. I wonder what Lance Kerwin's up to these days. James at 15 later. James at 16. Uh, they, they, there were controversies, man. You know? It was highly praised for its realism and sensitivity. Um, but... A lower middle class classmate discovers their father makes more money as a plumber than James's professor father. Um, and and his first, you know, his coming of age with a Swedish exchange student. Uh, yeesh. So that was very controversial. It was like. Some of the first teenage drug use and, and uh, promiscuity and things like that in it. Lance Kerwin. Lance Kerwin was like the go-to young guy in a lot of shows and stuff. Um, former American actor. Known for roles in his childhood and teen years. Uh, the Loneliest Runner is about a kid that had a bedwetting problem. And his mom would put his stained sheets outside the window so he would run so that none of his classmates could see it and became this great runner. Um, you know. Uh, in July 2010, Kerwin and his wife Yvonne pled guilty to falsifying document, documents to obtain state medical assistance in Hawaii. Kerwin was sentenced to five years probation and 300 hours of community service, he publicly apologized. He was on Emergency. He was on Little House in the Prairie. He was on Shazam, Cannon, uh, the ABC After School Specials. He was on a ton of those. Gunsmoke, Escape to Wish Mountain, uh, The Loneliest Runner, Wonder Woman, The Bionic Woman, um, Young Joe, The Forgotten Kennedy, Salem's Lot, um, CBS School Break special, Trapper John M.D., um, Murder, She Wrote. Last thing he was in was Outbreak in 1995. Um, so he lives in Hawaii and does minister work. The Loneliest Runner. The Loneliest Runner was nominated for two Emmys. Follows the story, 13-year-old John Curtis, played by Kerwin, and it was based on uh, Michael Landon, who still wets his bed. 13-year-old still wets his bed. The problem is publicized by his mother, Alice, who goes so far as to hang her son's stained bed sheets out the window for everyone to see. Fearing his friends will see the stained sheets, John runs home from school every day and takes them down to avoid further humiliation. Soon, however, the running becomes more than a race but an ambition. Partly because he loves it, but also to help him forget the shame and hurt of his unhappy home life, John starts running with the junior track team in order to channel his anger. Ten years later, he's an Olympic marathon runner and a gold medal winner. During a post-race interview, he gives credit to his mother for his success as a runner. Uh, it says, Michael Landon was the real-life version of The Loneliest Runner. As a child, he wet his bed until he was 14, and his mother, Peggy O'Neill, really did hang his sheets outside as a punishment. So, there you go. There you go. Prior to acting, Michael Landon also had Olympic ambitions as a javelin thrower. Due to an injury in his shoulder ligaments during college, Landon was unable to pursue a career in sports and started acting, which eventually led to three very successful television series, in addition to other acting, directing, and writing jobs on other shows. 
Yeah, because he had uh, Bonanza, and then he had uh, Little House on the Prairie, and then he had, what was it, Highway to Heaven or something? Uh, something like that. Terry Lawler says, we're scraping barrels now, Morty. I think we've been locked up for too long here in Ireland. What was the show where he was an angel? I think that was called Highway to Heaven. Oh, Touched by an Angel. Yes, that's what it was called, Touched by an Angel. That's it. Kind of a quantum leap vibe, a little bit. A little bit. Terry needs a cold shower. Well, or does he? Uh, I get so corrupt with you guys. Cold shower. I need waterfalls. Don't go chasing waterfalls. Please stick to the rivers and the mountains that you... Anyway. I thought she was English. I don't know who you're talking about, but... I got no idea who you're talking about there. Anyway. Little House in the Prairie. Touched by an Angel was on a long time, too. Was it Was it him? Let's see here. Now I got to look up Michael Landon. Michael Landon, American actor. He, uh, yeah, Highway to Heaven. That was him. It wasn't Touched by an Angel. That was that that lady highway to heaven was him. And what's that guy's name? Victor French or whoever, Jonathan Smith, highway to heaven. He was, Michael Landon was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and like three months later he was dead. He was in, uh, let's see here. These wilder years, then I was a teenage werewolf. And high school confidential. God's Little Acre, The Legend of Tom Dooley, The Errand Boy. Uh, an uncredited cameo. That's a Jerry Lewis movie. Love is Forever. Then Sam's Son. Those are his movies. He was in Cheyenne, uncredited, then Tales of Wells Fargo, then Cheyenne again, then Wanted Dead or Alive, then The Rifleman. And then after that on TV, I mean, I'm sure he did. He had to do have done more than that. He had to do have done Love Boat and Battle of the Network Stars and stuff. But Bonanza, Little House on the Prairie, and Highway to Heaven. And that kept him busy from 1959 to 1989, those three shows. Those three shows, you know. In 1991, during Landon's final Tonight Show appearance, Johnny Carson related how the actor took him back to a restaurant the two had dined at previously. Carson had been led to believe he accidentally ran over the owner's cat in the parking lot during their first visit. When sitting down to eat the second time, Carson discovered that Landon had helped create a fake menu of dinner items featuring cat metaphors. He was really a pretty funny guy. Um, Bonanza co-star David Canary said that one word to describe Landon was fearless in his dealings with network brass. Um... Often cited was Landon's bizarre sense of humor, which included having toads leap from his mouth and dressing as a superhero to visit a pizza parlor. Man, oh man. I'll tell you. Well, I'll tell you. He was really funny on The Tonight Show, always. Also appeared as a celebrity panelist on the network uh, game show Match Game on CBS. Up through the run of Highway to Heaven, all of Landon's television programs were broadcast on NBC. 
a relationship with lasted 30 consecutive years. After the cancellation of Highway due to a fallout with those within NBC's upper management, he moved to CBS and uh, was going to star in another TV series, but then he got the pancreatic cancer. And, well, you know, I was afraid of much. And at that point, it was pretty much, uh, you know. Uh, yeah. That, at that point, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. The reason that the people on the Bonanza show wore the same clothes all the time was that they would shoot everything out of sequence and they didn't want to have to remember what clothes they were wearing. So they said, eh, just put them in the same stuff. Kind of like Gilligan's Island. Uh. Morty Vickers says, Sliders, better than Quantum Leap. Um, I, I don't know that I disagree with that. Although Quantum Leap is really, really good. Sliders was really, really good, too. Those were two really good shows. I think, was Sliders a Fox show? I don't remember. Yeah. American television cities. Yeah, it was on Fox. And and that, that was the problem Sliders had. If it was on a, a different network, it would have lasted a lot longer. Uh lasted five seasons though it lasted five whole seasons and so did quantum leap did they ever tie up quantum leap was there ever a final tied it all up episode uh did they, did they ever the thing about sliders is it Gave us Carrie Wurr or Warrer or whatever. I wasn't mad at him about that. Sliders, sliders started coming off the tracks a little bit toward the end, though. Um, they they tricked it up a little too much toward the end. Let me see if Quantum Leap ever had a final tied up the whole series episode. Um. I wonder if it ever did. I can't remember. If they ever... Final episode. Here it says, at the end of season five, Belisario was told to write an episode that could serve as a season finale or a series finale. His whether Quantum Leap would be renewed was unclear. The episode contained some amp- answers to long-standing questions about the show, but contained enough ambiguity for a season six. However, when the show was not renewed... Two screenshots were tacked to the end of the last episode. One read that Al's first wife, Beth, never remarried, so they were still married in present day and had four daughters. The last screenshot said, Sam Beckett never returned home. The final was met by viewers with mixed feelings. After a few years years after airing of the finale, a script for an alternate ending was leaked on the Internet and implied that Al, through encouragement of his wife Beth, would become a leaper to go after Sam and that they would be leaping into the future. Belisario said no scripts exist and he does not know where this idea came from. However, in 2018, fan Allison Pregler purchased seven screenshots taken from season five that contained some shots of Al and Beth together. This implies that part of the alternate ending was, in fact, shot and gives credibility to the alternate ending scenario. In May 2019, a video of lost footage was actually uploaded to Reddit by a contributor with the handle Leaper1953. Scott Bakula confirmed that several endings were shot and that the footage was authentic. So there you are. There you go. There you are. They got a primetime Emmy for cinematography. An outstanding achievement for hairstyling. Uh, brother. Uh, 
Terry Lawler says, if you don't want to be touched, and especially if she's good looking, send her my way. You guys are getting filthy. Filthy. <laughs> Morty says, you all are very thirsty today. Well, you know, you got to do what you got to do, I suppose. I suppose you got to do what you got to do on the program. Terry Lawler says, anyways, before I go, Tom, Guinness have come up with a new stout. Claims it's as good as sitting and having a pint in an Irish rural pub. Can't wait to taste it. Coming to a venue near you soon. Probably not near me. I live in Utah. It'll be here in 10 years. About 10 years, probably. Man, is it windy. A lot of bunkety clunk going on. We have tumbleweeds here. We have actual tumbleweeds. I see them all the time. They uh, tumble as they blow across the prairie. We don't really have prairie, but whatever. But uh, but the Super League's gone, so I'm a happy man. The hairstyling, says Reverend Wabo. Yeah, boy. They, you know you've done something when you've got that primetime Emmy for original achievement in hairstyling. It's uh, awarded by Brill Cream, apparently. But we hope you've had a wonderful hump day. And as we slowly come to a crescendo here, uh, let's see how long this lasting this end song is. I don't want to. I want to screw things up at the end, but I'm. I'm out of. Oh yeah, I'm good. Okay, so uh, we'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. The Reverend Wild Bill, official spiritual advisor of the Tom Gully Show, down there in Hot Atlanta with his attack tarantula Morticia and his attack Emperor Scorpion Wang, Morty Vicker, the Sultan of the Outdoor Grill and the Band Hammer. Um, Terry Lawler says, some big wigs losing jobs because of the Super League, Tom. And they deserve it. Uh, Midnight Shepherd, of course, with us. Dolores Colbert was here earlier. And uh, who else do we have in the house? James Stone was here. Um, oh, hey, look, I'm getting a call. Okay, hold on. Just a second here. Yes, hello. A friend or family member who recently traveled with Marriott recommended. I just, what are you going to say? Terry Lawler, the King of Ireland, with us. Uh, anybody else? Well, some people that got banned, but other than them, nobody. Um, so, with all that being said, we'll be back here tomorrow. And the only thing left to say is, till next time, we'll see you next time. Come on. Right out of my